All right, so before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, first and foremost, I want to begin by offering a gigantic and heartfelt thank you to the Henry and Marilyn Taub Foundation for making this gathering possible. Um, the foundation has been an absolute incredible partner and champion for the direct care workforce because they understand that there's a very real connection between creating a strong workforce and supporting the health and well being of older adults aging in place in our communities. So, thank you. We literally would not be here without you. Thank you. So, as for our agenda, we are going to begin with some opening remarks from the Taub Foundation and PHI. And we're also going to hear a presentation from our own Stephen Campbell about PHI's newly released policy report on the New Jersey direct care workforce. And I'm not sure, I wanna pull your attention to this, but Robert put a chat into the chat box that has a link to that policy report. So if you're interested in checking that out before Stephen begins his presentation, I encourage you to click on that link. And then we also have a panel discussion. So we have four incredible panelists that I'm really looking forward to introducing you to. And that's gonna set us up for a group conversation where we can start really digging into what we see as the most important and pressing issues facing the direct care workforce. So, uh, we opened this event to the entire country and we're really excited about that because I think that there's real power in collaboration and in coming together and learning from one another. Um, so before I hand it over, I want to publish our poll results so that we can see who's in the room. Okay, so can I get a head nod if you guys can see these poll results? All right, I see some head nods, that's great. Thanks for the thumbs up, Lauren, I love that. All right, so <laughs> let's see here. So we have, in terms of the category uh, that best describes where you work. So let's see here. All right, so we have a pretty good variety. We have some in the foundation, philanthropy world, government, home care provider. It looks like the advocacy community is showing up. I love it. We have some from the union, residential care provider, university or college. We pretty much almost checked all the boxes here. So it's fantastic. Um, and then let's go into focus area. So again, we have a really good variety of focus. We have a lot of people who are working with older adults, people living with disabilities, gender equity, racial equity, social justice, workforce development. Again, we're all here and that's, that's so uh, exciting and heartening to see because I think, you know, I, speaking personally for me, I feel like a lot of the challenges that face the direct care workforce, they can be pretty big and complex. Um, and it's something that it's going to take all of us. It's going to take every single person in this room and beyond with all of our experience and different perspectives to come together to make the change that we need to see. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me get rid of these poll results. Let me see here. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Julia Stombos at the Henry and Marilyn Taub Foundation. Julia? There we go. I hit my mute button. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, Emily, can you just give me a heads up, if a thumbs up, if you can hear me okay? You sound great. Okay. So good morning and welcome to everybody who's joined the call today. I guess one of the consolations of holding a meeting virtually is that more people can attend than we would have been able to accommodate in person. Um, so good to see everybody here. My name is Julia Stumbos and I'm the program director for Aging in Place at the Henry and Marilyn Cow Foundation. And it's been my great pleasure to work with Jody and Robert and PHI, other staff members at PHI, over the past six or more years um, in this field. And one thing that we've definitely learned over this time is that shoring up the direct care workforce is hard work, takes time, there are a lot of challenges and we're working on it. Um, PHI and the Tau Foundation became acquainted back in 2013 and we began uh, engaging with PHI, PHI staff at that time 
to uh, do some research and analyze the direct care workforce landscape in New Jersey, specifically in our catchment area of Bergen and Passaic counties up in Northern New Jersey. Uh, and, and that work was followed a few years later by PHI working with some home care employers in our area to strengthen the recruitment, the training and the retention practices and for certified homemaker uh, home health aides. So this has been a rich um, body of work. I don't wanna steal any of the thunder from PHI um, <laughs> sharing the highlights from their report. I've had a little sneak peek at it, but it's, it's really hard to ignore the statistics that are pointing to the percentages of direct care workers who are women, who are people of color, who are immigrants, and who are older adults themselves. So, you know, the poverty level wages and the disproportionate numbers of these uh, workers who are on public subsidies uh, is what drove our foundation to, to this work. And now here we are in the third stage of the, of the three kind of pronged approach. Um, so PHI has just released this report, Crisis on the Front Line, New Jersey's Direct Care work Workforce, which I hope everybody's going to utilize in their work going forward. Um, they've organized this meeting today around the work from the past six years and the findings from that report. So with the goal of raising awareness of the workforce issues and just opening up the conversation today. So I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, I think today's conversations we're hoping will uh, open up a chance for us to talk about more opportunities after today. And um, I'm looking really forward to identifying a path forward with the input from all of the people on the call today. So it looks like from the registration list and from your survey that there are people here from, very, from, from different segments of the industry, um, both inside and outside of New Jersey, which is really exciting. Um, it's also encouraging to me just to know that there are that many dedicated professionals who are willing to collaborate on these issues and who want to improve life, not only for those who need care, but especially for those who are pr providing that care. Um, we're, we consider ourselves to be right in step with PHI's driving philosophy that the high quality care is only possible through high quality jobs. Very important philosophy. Um, and it's imperative that we figure out a way to compensate um, the direct care workforce in a way that values their role and all the hard work they do day in and day out. Um, so Jody and Robert and Peggy and all of the staff behind the scenes that have been working in New Jersey, we appreciate your help. We uh, thank you for bringing your expertise and your understanding to our state to work with us and to facilitate this call today. And I'm looking forward to hearing um, the input from all of the people on the call and figuring out how we can better support the workforce and bring more people to it. So Jody, I turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. And thank you for joining this critical conversation. Um, my, my task is to give you a little bit of background about PHI and not take too long so you can hear the good stuff from Stephen and Robert and others. So for close to 30 years, uh, PHI has worked to promote our quality care, quality job missions through an intentionally blended approach of both policy and practice work. So we develop curricula and design training programs that bring new workers into the field. We prepare incumbent workers for what is an ever-changing long-term care environment and we create opportunities for advancement for this workforce. At the same time, and informed by our work in the field, we seek to impact the public policies that are affecting the direct care workers by bringing a research-based policy and advocacy approach at both the state and the federal level. We believe, and, and we've shown, that leveraging this workforce, investing in this workforce, can lead to substantial improvements in care outcomes, as well as cost savings for the system, and at the same time, improve economic stability and the quality of life for direct care workers and their families. We work across the country and we work across long-term care settings. This discussion and the policy brief is grounded, is, is the culmination of the last six years, almost seven years of work that we've done here in New Jersey with the support of Julia and the foundation. As you'll hear from my colleagues, the poor quality of direct care jobs and the chronic underfunding of home and community-based services persists. 
and it obviously has only been amplified by the pandemic. That said, with every crisis comes opportunity and COVID has raised the visibility of the direct care workforce and the essential role that they play. I believe that we must act on this unprecedented moment. And I think we have to act together and that's come up uh, in, in the remarks so far and I'm sure it will throughout the, our time together here today. So again, I wanna thank you for joining us today and for contributing to the conversation about how we next best act here in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Jody and Julia. And with that, Stephen, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I just need a second to bring up your PowerPoint. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, I'm gonna ask for some head nods. Can you guys see the slides? Okay, wonderful, thank you. Stephen. Great, thank you, Emily, and, and thanks all for joining this call today. Uh, I'm going to pre present findings from the report that we released just today, Crisis on the Front Line, New Jersey's Direct Care Workforce. Uh, my name is Stephen Campbell. I'm the Data and Policy Analyst at PHI, where I track policy and practice trends in all 50 states. Uh, I'm also our lead data analyst, so that was the piece that I contributed to this report. But I'd also like to acknowledge Robert Espinoza for leading the drafting of this report, uh, many elements of the report and its production, uh, and also Colleen Diskin, our uh, consultant who contributed a rich narrative of qualitative data from the field, as I'll explain later. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Emily. Here's our agenda for today. In the next 10 minutes or so, I'll describe the background of this report and how we arrived at this uh, convening and this publication. Next, I'll share a snapshot of New Jersey's direct care workforce, including all of the most recent data analysis, data and analysis that are available for this workforce. And next, I'll share some of the qualitative findings that Colleen gathered from the field. If you haven't read the report yet, I would uh, urge you to uh, review it and, and read through that narrative that really paints a rich, rich picture of New Jersey's direct care workforce shortage. And finally, we'll end on a high note by describing the various and wide ranging policy opportunities that are available to us to transform uh, this workforce and in turn to transform uh, the LTSS system in New Jersey. Next slide, please. So I figured the best place to start for uh, this presentation would be the very beginning. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Emily. Uh, this report was really born out of a recognition of, of two things. First, that New Jersey faces unique challenges with its direct care workforce, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And second, that urgent action is needed to address these challenges and to take advantage of the heightened public attention on this workforce. As Julia mentioned, this work really began uh, six or seven years ago with a foundational study on New Jersey's home care landscape with a focus on Bergen and Passaic counties. And I should note that many of the findings that we uncovered then, uh, you know, six years ago now, uh, are really holding true today. In many ways, everything has changed in the field with the COVID-19 pandemic and the implementation of managed long-term care. Uh, but in so many ways, everything has stayed the same when it comes to this workforce, as I'll describe. The report itself, Crisis on the front line, is a, th is a synthesis of quantitative and qualitative findings uh, with a clear call to action uh, to, again, transform this workforce and ensure quality and consistent care for older adults and people with disabilities now and in the future. In a word, uh, it aims to move the long-term care sector from study and reflection and identification of issues toward action and intervention. Next slide, please. To set the table uh, for the various policy opportunities, I'd first like to share with you an overall picture of, of what New Jersey's direct care workforce looks like today. Uh, first, uh, the, we'll start with the various occupational titles that are predominantly used in New Jersey, uh, starting with the certified homemaker home health aid. Uh, these uh, are certified agency employed aides who provide personal care as well as health monitoring and maintenance to consumers who live at home or in some cases a residential setting. New Jersey is somewhat unique in the national landscape in that 
Uh, most of the home care workforce is certified as home health aides. In many other states, there are non-certified rules like personal care aides and other occupational titles. Next slide. Next, we have certified nurse aides. They have many of the same on-the-job responsibilities as home health aides, although their training requirements are distinct and, and different. Uh, and also, they tend to work in nursing homes and other residential care settings. Next slide, please. And finally, we have self-directed employees. These are uh, non-certified home care workers who are employed directly by consumers under state Medicaid programs. Uh, because they are private household workers, they are often excluded from labor data. So that's important to understand as we review the data in the coming slides. Next slide, please. The key uh, and high level trend for this workforce is that it is growing rapidly uh, in New Jersey and across the country. Uh, from 2009 to 2019, the workforce grew from 85,000 workers to over 111,000 workers. And when you look at the distribution of that growth, it primarily occurred among home health and personal care aides. Uh, so primarily in home and community-based settings. Over the past decade, eight in 10 new direct care, direct care jobs were either home health or personal care aid jobs. Next slide, please. There were three primary reasons for this growth. First, there is a growing population of older adults in New Jersey. And this new population of older adults, as compared to previous generations, has a strong preference to receive services in their private homes. This was probably always true among older adults and people with disabilities. The difference is today, uh, the third factor that drove this growth, that our policies and programs at the state and federal levels have caught up to that preference and made Medicaid-funded home and community-based services more available in home and community-based settings. Next slide, please. Turning now to the demographics of this workforce, as uh, Julia mentioned, most direct care workers in New Jersey are women, people of color, and immigrants. 91% are women, 82% are people of color, primarily Black or African American, and 54% are immigrants. They were born in another country. Next slide, please. And as we've noted already, these workers in, in New Jersey earn poverty wages. Uh, wages for direct care workers were 1336 in 2019 compared to 1395 in 2009. That's adjusting for inflation to 2019 dollars, so we're comparing apples to apples. Also, one in four workers works part time for a variety of reasons. There may be economic conditions that prevent them from working more, or they may have inadequate support at home and have other competing familial responsibilities. Also, their median annual earnings are $21,200 a year. So when we combine poverty wages with part-time hours, uh, the result is incredibly low compensation. Next slide, please. That poor compensation uh, results in immense economic instability for this workforce. 40% live in or near poverty, as defined by 200% uh, of the federal poverty level. 43% access some form of public assistance, most often Medicaid or uh, food and nutrition assistance, and 16% uh, lack any form of health insurance, which is especially troubling during this pandemic. Looking to the future from 2016 to 2026, this workforce will continue to grow. Uh, over that period, this workforce is expected to add over 33,000 new jobs. Uh, that's more new jobs than the second and third occupations with the, with the most job growth combined. So more than laborers, movers, and registered nurses. Uh, next slide, please. But when we account for all job openings, so both job openings created by growth and demand and job openings created when workers either transfer occupations, leave the field, or leave the labor force altogether, the numbers are absolutely eye-watering. From 2016 to 2026, we can expect uh, over 185,000 job openings in the direct care workforce, which ranks them among various other occupations with high turnover and, and many labor force exits. And many of these occupations in retail, cashiers, waiters and waitresses, uh, movers, they all have low barriers to entry and may offer a competitive wage. Uh, so this is the competition that we're going to see now and in the coming decade. Next slide, please. 
So now I'd like to share uh, the qualitative findings from this report that, again, paint a rich picture of what the direct care workforce shortage looks like in New Jersey. And again, I would urge you to, to read through that report and read through the rich narrative contained therein. Uh, but I'm going to share with you four high-level findings from the report. Next slide. The first is that the workforce shortage has systemic causes. Employers understand uh, that a higher wage and better job quality would improve working conditions and uh, really start addressing their workforce challenges, but they are bound by low reimbursement rates and their ability to invest in this workforce. That was true all the way back in 2014 in our original landscape study as well. We heard from home care uh, providers in particular that the transition to managed long-term care really lowered their reimbursement rates and made it more difficult to invest in this workforce. Next slide. Also in this current moment, COVID-19 has worsened existing shortages and introduced new challenges. It's worsened existing sh shortages, not just because many workers are becoming ill. Um, we see the data from nursing homes in New Jersey making uh, you know, front page news across the country, uh, but also many of these uh, workers might have competing responsibilities at home now because maybe their children aren't able to attend school. And in terms of new challenges, providers now have the added cost of personal protective equipment. There were both supply chain issues and cost issues. As the pandemic started and supply was short, many PPE providers who were selling supplies like masks and gloves and gowns sharply increased their prices. So while providers were trying to gather more PPE than they were before, uh, the cost was multiplied further by the higher cost of PPE. Uh, next slide, please. But throwing money at this issue and improving wages alone won't address all of the workforce shortage issues in New Jersey. We heard uh, from providers the creative ways in which they're creating a more supportive environment for their workers by implementing practices of clear communication that's so essential during the COVID-19 pandemic and supportive supervision. So creating a workplace culture that supports the worker is important as, as, as well. In terms of monetary solutions, I, I'd like to acknowledge the state for investing uh, both in home care and nursing homes uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, but the new reimbursement rates that those providers received largely helped them cover new costs like PPE and uh, transportation assistance where that was necessary. And those added investments really didn't result in the transformative change that we know is needed in terms of providing workers with a high quality training and a living wage. Next slide, please. But there is opportunity in this crisis as well. The pandemic has focused public attention on the direct care workforce nationally and in New Jersey in an unprecedented way. This is an opportunity for us to really capitalize on that attention and affect the strong job quality that we've known for decades is so needed. So let's talk about that now. Next slide, please. Uh, we've, we've listed some policy opportunities at the end of this report that require collaboration and strong uh, sort of uh, partnerships between states and employers and many other actors uh, that will have cross-cutting uh, benefits for consumers and workers alike. Next slide, please. The first is to improve compensation. There was a clear message from everyone we spoke to in New Jersey, both in 2014 and today, that compensation is a foundational issue. These workers are earning poverty wages, uh, not only does that harm their economic stability, but it makes these jobs less competitive in the job market. So improving compensation not only helps workers, uh, but will also help the sector by making these jobs competitive in any labor market conditions, whether that's the pandemic-induced recession or the post-pandemic uh, recovery that will come uh, in the coming years. Next slide, please. But aside from compensation, we must implement a range of job quality improvements. Other examples of job quality interventions including, include uh, establishing workforce pipelines and recruitment streams uh, statewide to bring job seekers into this field, uh, and also creating new advanced roles for this workforce. They often la lack opportunities for advancement. Next slide, please. 
as well as the general job quality issues we need to address, because this workforce is comprised primarily of women of color, we must address the inequities in this workforce. We know that workers of color in the field face immense bias and discrimination based on the color of their skin and other uh, personal characteristics. Some examples of how employers and uh, policymakers could work together include uh, gathering data on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as uh, improving uh, funding for local racial, race, race equity uh, organizations in local communities. Next slide, please. We also need better data collection systems more generally to measure the size, stability, and compensation of this workforce, which would help us understand uh, the size, scope, and causes of New Jersey's direct care workforce shortage. Uh, these data are sorely lacking nationally, but there's a real opportunity now to really develop these systems, uh, both for, uh, for just generating baseline data, but also evaluating change over time. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, convening a statewide work group comprised of diverse stakeholders, uh, state-sponsored work groups can be sort of a springboard opportunity to uh, affect bold and innovative policy change at the state level. It's also a way to sort of uh, bring the field together and, and work in one direction. Next slide, please. And finally, we, we need to launch an advocacy campaign to take advantage of this moment uh, to really uh, make these policy opportunities real uh, and policy change real for this workforce. And this requires some degree of funding, some degree of collaboration uh, and coalition building so that again, we're all working in the same direction in a planful and coordinated manner to affect the change that we know is needed. Next slide. So that's the end of my presentation. Here's my contact information. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the chat box and uh, myself and our PHI colleagues will work to address them. Uh, thank you, I'll turn it back over to you, Emily. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm wondering if you could put your email address into the chat box, just in case someone doesn't have a chance to write it down in the meantime. Okay, great. So Stephen, you just gave us a wealth of information and data to digest. And I am so excited to introduce our four panelists who are going to help us sort of process all of the information that we just heard from Stephen and that you will find in our new PHI policy report. First and foremost, I'm going to introduce Rakaya Yearby who is the co-founder and executive director of the Institute for Healing, Justice, and Equity. She's also a professor of law and member of the Center for Health Law Studies at St. Louis University. Hi, Rakaya, how are you? I can see you, so that's wonderful. Hi. All right, we also have Evelyn Liebman, who is the director of advocacy for AARP. Hey, Ev, I see you waving too. And then we have Diane Silbernagel, Executive Director of Home Care Options. Hi, Diane. And last but certainly not least, we have Steve Landers, who is the President and CEO of VNA Health Group. Hi, Steve, how you doing? All right, so we asked each panelist to take five to seven minutes to talk about one immediate policy opportunity that they see for the direct care workforce in New Jersey. And we're going to start with Rakaya, who's going to offer us sort of a national perspective on how she is processing that question. So we're going to start with the national perspective, and then we're going to move to our three New Jersey-based panelists. So Rakaya, I'm going to hand it over to you. And if I am remembering correctly, you have some slides, right? So I can I go do. ahead and pull those up. Okay. I do. But you know what? If possible, could I share them? Could I yeah. uh, share my screen? Sure. Let me just, can you go ahead and try to do that? I just want to make sure you have the ability to. I don't. That's why. I... Okay. Let me, one moment. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. Go ahead and try now. I can. Great. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. You're welcome. And I asked uh, to share just because I have um, 
updated. So you should be able to see the subtitles just in case um, you need to read. So thank you so much for including me in this um, discussion today. And I'm going to talk about the employment conditions that increase exposure to COVID-19 and ways that we can support direct care workers during the pandemic. Um, so here is my roadmap. I will be able to do this in five to seven minutes, so no worries. Um, I'm going to do the high points and then please let me know if you have any additional questions. Um, so some of the statistics we have about direct care workers um, are on this slide. Unfortunately, these numbers are as of July 23rd. And really the problem is, and I'm going to highlight this in some of the solutions uh, that I propose, is that many states do not collect deaths by professions or even disaggregate the deaths between nursing home residents and workers. And so as you look at this, just know that this doesn't include the full impact on direct care workers. Uh, one of the things that I do want to highlight, though, is that studies um, published by the Harvard Medical School and the Lancet Public Health um, have noted that healthcare workers of color are more likely to care for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 and nearly twice as likely as their white counterparts to test positive for COVID. When we take a look at the COVID-19 response, some of the main issues that increase uh, COVID-19 infections and deaths for all healthcare workers, but particularly for direct care workers, is the lack of paid sick leave and health insurance. And in PHI's report, they note systemic racism is a problem. I deem it, I call it structural racism. And for me, it really refers to the ways that laws and policies are written and enforced that disadvantage racial and ethnic minorities. And we can see this uh, in terms of direct care workers in their lack of paid sick leave. When we go back to the New Deal and the Jim Crow area, era, um, collective bargaining rights were not equally distributed. So racial and ethnic minorities were left out either explicitly or unions were allowed to leave them out. And that's how majority of workers got paid sick leave. Um, and so clearly many of the direct care workers are uh, suffering from this. Now we did see some changes in the law under the Obama administration, but what we've seen most recently is a shift back to putting these workers as independent contractors. And as such, they're not covered under paid sick leave, under workers' comp. We see many of the direct care workers having to pay for their own masks or trying to, um, trying to create their own hand sanitizer. And we see that initially many of the direct care workers, home care workers were laid off during the pandemic, but have been now called up to replace many of the workers who have gotten sick or died in hospitals and nursing homes. Finally, even when we try to provide some support for uh, workers, we kept out certain groups. And so we see this particularly for home health care workers who were not covered by the CARES Act, employment protections and paid sick leave and unemployment you know, benefits. So what are some of the changes that we need to make in our COVID-19 response? Uh, one is that we need to provide direct care workers with paid sick leave and hazard pay. As I noted in the CARES Act, they were left out. Um, and so we need to move forward to put them back in. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of states, um, not including New Jersey, that have tried to provide some additional pay um, a little bit later. We also need to disaggregate the data about healthcare worker infections and death, particularly when we're talking about nursing homes and um, home healthcare workers. Um, just recently, there was an article that mentioned in St. Louis that 500 
125 residents had died at one nursing home, um, but it made no mention of the actual workers. And we need to include in our stay-at-home orders and emergency laws these protections. Again, I'm using St. Louis because that's where I am, uh, but many of the stay-at-home orders and emergency laws did not include safety protections for essential workers and definitely not for workers in nursing homes and those providing care in the home. We need to provide a guaranteed basic income for direct workers. I think this really gets to some of the issues about poverty uh, for workers. Um, we can see during this time, during COVID-19, many mayors, many people have rolled out uh, guaranteed basic income uh, research um, and trials. We see that in Compton, uh, California, and this would be a great opportunity to support the workers who are essential to us and allow them to uh, be able to provide for their families and for themselves. We need to think about testing workers at hotspots and prioritizing access to healthcare for direct care workers. You'll note in many of the documents from the CDC and OSHA about protecting workers um, that they don't mention testing. Um, and this has been an issue uh, definitely around nursing homes. Uh, we need to provide workers compensation. And as I mentioned before, because many direct care workers are treated as independent contractors, they are not included under workers' compensation. So if they get sick uh, while they are providing care, they don't get, um, they don't get payment, um, they don't get health insurance. And we need to allocate resources to those most impacted, particularly for those working in nursing homes and in, um, in homes. And so just a couple of examples in New Hampshire, <clears throat> sorry, Arkansas and uh, Virginia, the governors actually did provide hazard pay. So they were able to take some of the CARES funding and then shift it to direct care workers, home health care workers that were providing care. Um, but this has not happened nationally and I suggest that we do. And so finally, here's just a couple of additional readings. I've been writing on particularly how structural racism, how our laws have disadvantaged home health care workers and direct care workers. And so with that, um, I'll just say one more thing. Uh, and the other article talks about how uh, we are not protecting workers and how we need to shift sort of OSHA. And so with that, I will stop sharing. Wonderful. And I just thank you. Thank you, Rakaya. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Ev. So you have the floor. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you so much for inviting AARP to be here this morning uh, to be part of this important conversation. Um, and congratulations to PHI and the TAB Foundation uh, for releasing this important report, uh, particularly now, um, and uh, for the discussion on uh, policy opportunities. Uh, and what I'll talk a little bit about is how they are actually policy necessities, uh, particularly now. Um, at AARP in New Jersey, we represent approximately 1.3 million members uh, here in the Garden State and 38 million members nationwide and uh, at our mission's core is to empower people to choose how they live as they age. Um, and certainly our system of long-term care is an important component of that. Um, and uh, just as we heard about uh, the increasing need um, for the workforce, uh, that need is against the backdrop of an aging society. Um, here in New Jersey, uh, currently about 14% of uh, New Jerseyans are now 65 years and older. Uh, by 2032, not too long from now, uh, that number will grow to 21, 22% of the population, um, which is of course driving um, much of the need in this area. Um, and I certainly agree uh, with uh, the statement that high quality care uh, is inextricably linked with 
high quality jobs um, and we need to move uh, to that place um, and we need to get there sooner rather than later. Uh, if anything, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating impact and tragedy uh, that has unfolded in nursing homes uh, leads everyone to that con conclusion. Um, and again, just to put some numbers on that, um, in New Jersey, um, approximately 7,000 residents and staff have died during this pandemic of COVID-19. We are absolutely in a second wave um, and we know the link between community spread and its impact on nursing homes. Currently, we have outbreaks in 200 facilities here in New Jersey and have a, had a cumulative outbreak uh, of over 850 in over 850 facilities. Um, so uh, there is no time like the present um, to, to move forward um, with many of these policy changes that are so necessary. Um, we um, at AARP, um, certainly one of our uh, priorities is to rebalance our long-term care system. Uh, it recognizes, as we heard earlier, um, that uh, most people want to age in place in their homes, in their communities, um, and need a high quality direct care workforce to be able to do that, along with the millions of unpaid family caregivers um, who provide support to allow their loved ones to do that. Um, New Jersey has made some progress in rebalancing that system, um, but we have a long way to go. Um, we rank 46th in the country in terms of dollars that are directed to home and community-based based services versus institutional services. And we know that if we can better balance our system, that will free up dollars, free up resources to help support the workforce, um, both in our nursing homes um, and at home. Um, I wanna really just touch on um, some of the work that uh, we, along with uh, other advocates um, and workers um, have been doing here in New Jersey, um, some of which started even before the pandemic, um, but a number of which have been um, uh, worked on um, as this tragedy has unfolded. Um, and I think that uh, some of the reforms that we've been able to accomplish here in New Jersey um, speak to a number of issues that Rakia has just laid out, but also perhaps can serve as a model for the nation. Um, just several weeks ago, New Jersey enacted uh, legislation to require um, mandatory minimum staffing ratios in long-term care facilities for the direct care workforce, something that we have been working on uh, for at least the last five years um, and uh, we're very excited to be able to make that structural reform to our system. Um, not only will that um, support the workforce, but obviously it will support the residents in these facilities. Um, whose uh, everyday lives are so impacted by this workforce. I know that firsthand having a loved one in a long-term care facility myself. Uh, we also recently enacted legislation um, to increase the minimum wage for direct care workers in New Jersey's long-term care facilities, along with uh, increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates um, uh, for long-term care facilities, um, important in New Jersey and as important uh, as increasing that funding come important regulatory oversight measures uh, to ensure accountability uh, around that funding and, uh, uh, and that the dollars are used for the benefit uh, of the care, which includes um, supporting the workforce in these facilities. Uh, New Jersey just enacted the first in the nation direct care funding ratio for long-term care facilities, which requires 90% of funding be used for resident care, uh, limiting the amount of dollars that can be used for administrative costs and profits. Um, we think that that is a very significant um, 
change to our system. Um, we also um, created a task force here in New Jersey, um, which uh, will look at uh, issues around rebalancing our long-term care system to ensure uh, that we are spending our money wisely and in support of everyone's desire to age in place, um, but importantly, how those dollars can be spent um, to improve the workforce um, and improve the care uh, in our long-term care facilities. And I think now is a moment uh, where we can really begin to think about the kind of fundamental changes in our long-term care system um, and perhaps start to reimagine a completely different model to ensure uh, that not only is uh, the workforce, the kind of quality workforce that we need, whether it's in institutional care or at home care, um, but the kind of infrastructure we need uh, to ensure that everyone um, can age safely um, uh, throughout their lives. Um, Wonderful. We, um, also- I have, uh, I have just a, just a quick uh, 30 second warning. Oh, okay. Um, again, I think that um, this, uh, this work to improve the workforce um, and meet the challenges ahead are so important. Um, and uh, I'd say of all of the, po I think every policy opportunity is a necessity um, and look forward uh, to working with all of the advocates and workers and um, the industry to ensure that the changes are actually implemented um, quickly. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, Ev. And Diane, I'm going to hand it to you. It looks like you're still on mute, Diane. There we go. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning. I'd like to uh, thank PHI and the TAB Foundation for this report and for your leadership as we move forward in response to this workforce crisis. Uh, the identified challenges are having a major impact on the consumers of home health care. Uh, as you know, I'm from a, a small home care agency in northern New Jersey. Clients are being underserved, uh, not just because of a lack of home health aides, but also because of other uh, payers that are reducing the amount of services that they're authorizing for clients in their homes. As a result, clients are at greater risk for poor outcomes uh, due to the insufficient resources of the direct care providers. I am very concerned about the safety of individuals trying to survive alone in their homes without the help they need. Our certified home health aides provide an essential service that truly saves lives. And I can give you a recent example. One of our aides was helping a client into the shower when she noticed a small red spot on the client's toe. She did as she was trained. She called the nurse. The client was assessed in the emergency department and within 24 hours received vascular surgery to address the problem. Um, and I have many examples of uh, situations where our aides absolutely intervened in a timely manner that prevented a, a healthcare crisis. This aide was attentive, she was knowledgeable, and she was accountable for the client's well being. Many of our home health aides have been lifesavers for their clients, demonstrating exemplary human concern. They are remarkable direct care providers. They serve from their hearts, they are resilient, and they are exceptional individuals who I can tell you continue to inspire me after 40 years of community based care. When we were uh, discussing this event today, Robert suggested that we focus on one of the policy opportunities in the report, one that we believe will improve the um, home health aid workers' jobs and lives. While the policy opportunities presented on page 22 of this report are all critical to success, opportunity number three spoke to me. This policy opportunity addresses job improvements and widespread support. I have observed how responsive our staff have been to quality training. There is a tremendous secondary benefit of convening the home health aid staff where they can validate and support each other with their own lessons learned. With support of the Taub Foundation and PHI, we have taken baby steps to offer a career ladder. We developed a cohort of our expert, expert aides as peer mentors. With another group of shining stars, we trained them as certified community health workers, enabling them to be dual certified. 
We provided certified nursing assistance with the um, CHHA certification course, so they too can have home care skills and expand their opportunities. We've trained nursing students as certified home health aides so they can gain experience while being a student. And these opportunities, we believe, build community and pride among the direct service workers. Day-to-day -day workplace learning is critical to quality. And this takes place during supportive supervision visits by the registered nurse. Here in New Jersey, we need managed care reimbursement for nursing supervision visits. This valuable training that takes place during this time keeps clients out of the hospital. The essential role that the direct care workforce brings to healthcare and controlling healthcare costs must be recognized and national media support is needed now. We need to increase our workers' access to internet and ongoing learning opportunities. I am fearful that we will continue to lose our most caring direct care staff as compassion fatigue will wear them down. The traumatic stress from witnessing repetitive loss among clients takes its toll. I can tell you I'm in awe of our survivors, those long-term aides who have done this work for 30, 40 years without the benefit of privilege or resources, have coped and developed resiliency to long-term traumatic stress of human caring. These amazing workers have found meaning in their work and they have shown others that there is dignity in caring for people. It is time that we all do our best to work together and to care for our caregivers as we move forward. Thank you. Diane, thank you. I'm really resonating right now with your description of, of survival and resilience, so thank you. They're amazing, really. They, re they really, really are. Uh, so with that, Steve, I'm gonna ask you to take us home. Sure. Thanks for including me, and uh, thank you for the work that uh, PHI is doing, and you know, obviously the support from Taub Foundation. What an incredible um, partnership! Uh, you know, I, I serve as a leader for a visiting nurse association uh, health group in New Jersey. We provide a range of home and community-based services, actually here and in several other other states, uh, but we're headquartered here in Jersey, and we we employ um, about 300 home health aides out of, out of our um, uh, 2,300 employees in New Jersey are home, are home health aides. Uh, and largely, our, our work and my work with home health aides here is within uh, the Medicare certified home health programming and the hospice, hospice care. And certainly, you know, my personal background, well, I'll get to that in a second. What I'll say is that uh, we've, we've worked hard. I'm, I'm encouraged uh, about some of the things we've been able to do to improve the the, the wages and, and working conditions, benefits, tuition reimbursement, um, hazard pay for our aides, but I'm not satisfied. More, more work has to be done. And like I said, we're not working uh, largely within the Medicaid system, which uh, definitely has even more um, obstacles, I'd say, to being able to expand uh, the opportunities for, for the home health aides. But, you know, as a, as a family doc, uh, geriatric medicine doc, the way I got involved in home care was actually by making visits myself, and I made thousands of home visits. And, you know, probably the most humbling thing that I saw and have learned about in my home visits is the impact of uh, home health aids on human health. And it's often, you know, I, I spent a lot of time to try and become a physician and was, you know, pretty proud of that. But it, 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 you, you do see um, often, if not more often than not, the, the impact on health uh, and, and people's well-being by the work of the aides being more than any medicine or lab service or, you know, physician intervention. It's, it's really um, high impact and I've seen people, you know, lives saved many times, lives saved, families saved, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of potential hospital and nursing facility costs saved um, by uh, the work of the aides. So, um, I, I think this requires just a lot of focus. I think, you know, big picture, I think we've got kind of two uh, things, two issues that are kind of, they're battling each other a little bit, um, which is sort of the, um, the, the plight of the direct care worker and the cost and affordability of long-term care uh, for a rapidly aging population, the expense for families, the expense for state and federal governments. Um, it's not zero sum, but it is, there are some issues there that have to be fleshed out. We are in the midst of tripling 
the number of people 85 and older in our country between uh, 2020 and 2060, and uh, the caregiver ratios have gone down. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a real issue. And also there's health equity issues on the access to long-term care side and vulnerabilities amongst families that, that need services uh, as well. And so we've got a lot of work to do. I, I think when I look at um, you know, some of the recommendations and also just generally, you know, some of the op big opportunities, one I think has been mentioned is, uh, you know, New Jersey, we spend a lot of money disproportionate compared to other states on uh, nursing facility care. And are there opportunities to create value by rebalancing, you know, some of the way we spend our, our dollars that could create some additional resources to invest in the workforce so that you can get some things that are win-wins if you will. Um, another area I think is really crucial to focus on, um, we are in the midst of a nursing shortage. And um, if you look nationally, we need about 200 to 220,000 new registered nurses a year, uh, given retirements and demographics and what have you. And our nursing schools are only creating uh, about 150,000 new registered nurses each year. Um, there's lots of job openings. Uh, we need uh, more people, and if, and if we can find ways to improve um, people's overall lifetime earnings by finding opportunities for them to get into in, in, in fields within the nursing realm, I think that would be an incredibly important area to focus on. We're, we've been trying a program called what we call Power Aids, where we're providing uh, tuition reimbursement for some home health aides that are working as home health aides, but also you know, it's a big lift for them. They're also going to school um, to become nurses. And I think those type of investments, if not just done privately, but publicly in certain ways, could, could make a big impact on people's total lifetime opportunity and create more of a, of a career ladder. And, and so, again, uh, you know, this is a topic there's so much to, to touch on. And I, I know we're short on time, but uh, thank you for the work that you're doing and, and look forward to collaborating. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. And thank you to all of our panelists. We do have a question or time for a question. If any participants are sitting here listening to our panelists and something is coming up for you, a question is coming up for you, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand. So click on that participants icon, raise your hand, let me know if you would like to share. Or again, you can throw your name into the chat box. I'm going to take this as a reflection on how wonderful all of our panelists were, that there are no immediate questions popping up for people. But if participants, something comes up for you in a minute or two, that's OK. Keep using that chat box. Feel free to put your questions in there as we continue together. Um, so I just, again, want to take a moment to thank Stephen, to thank Steve and Rakaya and Diane and Ev for providing us, for gifting us with all of this critical insight. And right now in this moment, we don't necessarily have um, a ton of time to dig into a super deep strategic conversation, but we do wanna start the dialogue. We do wanna hear from you. How is this landing? What are, what are you sitting with? As we talk about these challenges and these opportunities, what, what's rising to the top for you? And so we've developed two poll questions um, to help us explore this together. So I'm going to go ahead and start the first poll. Give me just one moment. Okay, so our first poll question is we want you to think overall. So overall, based on this discussion, based on what we just heard from our panelists and from Stephen, what do you feel is the most important to strengthen the direct care workforce? So big picture overall, what's most important? Go ahead and take a moment to answer this question. Okay. Answers are coming in. Uh, 
All right, I'm gonna give you just another 20, 25 seconds or so. And if there's something, again, if you feel like we're missing a category, we're missing the response that you wanna give, feel free to share it in the chat box. Okay, so another five seconds. Okay. Let's take a look at our responses. Okay, so let's take a look here. We have 40% of respondents are saying that we need to improve compensation, 40%. Is anyone terribly surprised by that? Just, yeah, no, no, okay. Uh, we also see uh, increasing reimbursement rates. Next, we have enhanced training requirements and programs at 6%. And then we have two responses. So creating career advancement opportunities and addressing gender and racial inequalities are both coming in at 11%. And then we also have launching a multi-year statewide advocacy effort at 14%. Wonderful. So I'm just curious, anybody from New Jersey uh, would like to come off of mute and just share a minute or two about why you chose what you chose. Go ahead and raise your hand by clicking on that participants icon or let me know in the chat box. Anyone wish to share? Uh, hi, this is Padma. I am Padma? Yeah, Padma Arvind, I'm from New Jersey. I chose Hello. improving compensation. Uh, I had worked with actually, um, uh, you know, the direct work uh, service workers coalition, as well as with uh, Matini Hospital and, uh, you know, ABCD group. And I know how hard it is to find direct service workers with such mm -hmm. a low rate. And when the cost of living is really is increasing and the amount of work that the direct service workers are doing and such a low wage salary, it is really hard for them even to meet both ends meet. And I think mm -hmm. it is very, very hard for anybody to survive. Even though Governor Murphy said that we need to increase the basic wages to $12 an hour. It's very hard for many organizations even to pay that kind of salary. So I think we needed to have great advocacy and we need to work in order to increase their salary to a minimum of $15 an hour, which is even below the decent wage scale right now. So I think we needed to work towards that and the improving the compensation for the amount of work that they do the empathy, the patient, passion, mm. and also the mental toll and the emotions draining that they have in taking care of the patients, I think it is much less. And I think we need to work towards giving them a better compensation. So that Absolutely. is why I chose the improving compensation as my first choice. Thank you, Padma. Thank you. And I heard two really important points there. It sounds like you are living firsthand the effects of working with a workforce that is um, systemically underpaid and what that means for their life and their well-being and for the strength of the workforce. And then I also really appreciated you bringing up the point that it's important that we pay the direct care workforce a commensurate wage that reflects the skill and the like you said, the emotional intelligence, the skill, the compassion, the resilience that they show day in and day out, and that those, it all, it all goes together. So I very much appreciate you being willing to share, and I think those are really important points to make. Thank you. Hi, this is Nancy from Home Care and Hospice Association. Oh, hi, Nancy. Thanks for inviting me. It's been um, very, very helpful. The statistics are wonderful that you shared. I actually will be sharing it with the governor's office today because they were asking me for some very specific stats and some of them you guys covered. So that's amazing. Um, I chose uh, increased reimbursement rate in general for providers because I think we need to increase the rates for our workers. But I also think, you know, the state is very focused on 
the reimbursement rate just for providers, forgetting that in that bundled reimbursement rate, they cover everything else, right? So our supervisory visits for our nurses, our schedulers, our billers, everything is covered under that one rate. So we need to make sure that we increase the reimbursement rate in general, a large portion of that would go to the, um, to the worker, but then also it would go to covering all the other expenses that um, are incurred that I think the state kind of forgets about. And, you know, every man this and you need to do that and forgetting that there's only this one bundled rate. Um, and then I think, you know, it's demoralizing. You look and, you know, I, I was at Target yesterday and it's like, hey, we're paying $15 an hour for you to work at Target, but we can't pay our folks $15 an hour. And so the work that they do is so valuable and yet we can't pay them the same amount that we're paying a Target worker. And a Target worker can take a bus and spend an eight hour shift at one location and not go, not be on a bus and take many, you know, go to many different people's houses and take care of people. So I think, you know, there needs to be more opportunities in general, but I also think just increasing the wage will help show them how important they truly are. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is um, the legislature um, had created a caregivers task force um, that was started in March by the commissioner of human services. And then it was kind of put on hold and is now back in um, back in force and I'm the chairwoman of it. And, you know, they're looking at paid and unpaid caregivers. So, um, you know, both. Um, but, you know, I'd love to have PHI um, speak at one of our sessions because I think you guys have a lot of great information and they're always looking for more information. So um, I'm really happy. Wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. Absolutely. We will 100%. I'm looking at, at you, Robert. I am, I am confident that we will be following up with you <laughs> after this. So I very much appreciate you pointing that opportunity out for us. So I'm going to go ahead and open our second poll. And this is a little, oh, I'm sorry, I was still sharing the results. Okay, so let me pull up the last poll here. And you're going to see that the question is a little different and the answers are the same. So we want you to think among these issues, where do we start? What do we start within the next three to six months? Where do we begin? So this is about immediacy in this moment. So go ahead and let us know what you think. All right, we still have answers coming in, so go ahead and take another 20 seconds or so. Okay. All right, let's look at the results, which are very interesting. Okay, so we see here that our responses changed a bit from that first question. So when we're asked about immediate opportunity, where do we begin? The highest, the, the answers with the most responses are the ones towards the bottom. So we have launching a multi-year statewide advocacy effort at 23%. We also have forming a statewide direct care work group at 23%. So those were our top two vote getters. And then in third place, we have increasing reimbursement rates, and then we have improving compensation. So I think it's fascinating that our answers to the first question are pretty markedly different than what we see when we think about immediate opportunity. Where do we wanna start? So that's the question that I have for you. I'm wondering again, if someone is willing to come off mute and share with us, did you answer the first question and second question differently? And if so, why? And you can either raise your hand or put your name in the chat box and I can call on you. All right, so Jennifer, I see your hand raised, go right ahead. 
Hey there. So my answer was actually the same for both. Um, I work for a technical college in northeastern, northwestern Wisconsin. And one of the things that we look at in our local workforce group is the low-hanging fruit. And what I can tell you is being an educator who came out of the long-term care sector, um, I worked for a large CCRC owner operator in the Philadelphia market, is that we have a really big disconnect between um, the long-term care understanding of workforce development, um, the sharing that there is dollars available to go to college. I can tell you culturally, I have heard anecdotally, that there's a lot of kind of, you know, you don't want to go and get a degree, just be a CNA. You don't want to, you should still always be the housekeeper. You don't want to go on and enhance your education. And unfortunately, that internal culture of, of what education means in the long-term care sector is meaning that people are exiting stage door left and going on and doing another career rather than trying to um, upskill themselves to remain within the aging services field. So again, the low hanging fruit, I think, is that we already have educational systems in place across this country, but gerontology programs are closing their doors because there's this weird kind of vibe between industry and what's happening in the educational sector. Thank you. Mm. No, thank you, Jennifer. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of those core tenets of needing to create accessible pathways for career advancement within aging services. So no, thank you. I appreciate that. And Ev, I see your hand up. So let me go to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, so I was one of those who in the first survey uh, clicked uh, increase compensation. And then in the second one uh, went down to the, to the establishment of the public private partnership and task force. And I, I'd say for myself, the reason for that is that I think that there is absolutely an immediate need to increase compensation for this workforce, as we've heard, um, whether, uh, you know, we're competing with the targets and the Amazons for this workforce. Um, and uh, I would argue that uh, our direct care workers um, take on a much harder job. Um, uh, both uh, emotionally and physically and their level of training and expertise. And um, so we do need to value that work through increased compensation, but we need to uh, be able to figure out systemic ways to sustain uh, the work. And uh, Steve mentioned this a little bit in terms of the rebalancing efforts, uh, taking a look at the role of Medicaid managed care in our Medicaid system. Um, and it's through that sustained multi-stakeholder effort uh, that we, I believe, provides the, the clearest path to implementing uh, sustainable and systemic changes. Thank you. It sounds like you want to start with the vehicle. That's going to get us there. Right. <laughs> nice. uh, hi, it's uh, Padma again. Hi, Padma. I, um, initially, I said, you know, we increased the workers' compensation. And second, I said, like, we need to start a statewide advocacy group as well as a statewide group. The reason I said that was I am working very actively to increase the community healthcare workers' salary and to make uh, their reimbursable occupation. Uh, we cannot just increase somebody's salary just like that, right? It has to go through, like if it is a CMS reimbursement or if it is a reimbursement through the government system or reimbursement through the hospital system, you need to prove that there is a risk management and there is a payer's reimbursement or whatever that is. You have to go through a process to make it sustainable for even the hospital or even for the payer, right? So in order to do that, you need to work to make it as a sustainable wage. You have to work it through a group. It is always possible to make a group voice heard and to make it sustainable in a longer run. So in order to make it as effective and permanent, I think we have to form a group and a coalition or form a union for them, right? There are some jobs where we are not unionized as yet. So we had to form it as a union or form as a coalition or form as a advocacy group and then move from there. As I said, right now, there is a lot of funds that are available 
even through the disaster relief grant funds, mm -hmm. but that is not permanent. That's a temporary thing. But to bring a permanent change, we had to work through the advocacy group and bring a major change through the CMS system and work through that. So that's why I chose that option. Thank you, Thank Padma. You. Thank you. I also want to read uh, a comment that we got in the chat box from Lauren Snedeker. Lauren says, I chose a work group because I feel that including direct care workers in these efforts is critical. My hope would be the work group includes not only workers themselves, but many of the great minds on this call today to help push for change. So thank you for that, Lauren. <laughs> thank you for that, Lauren. And that's actually a wonderful segue. I'm going to pass it off to Robert, who is going to help us sort of capture some of the themes that have been coming up for us today and talk a little bit more about where we go from here. Yes, thank you, Emmeline. Um, thank you, everyone. What an incredible conversation. Um, I want to start, first of all, by thanking all of our panelists and all of our participants for your rich insights. Um, thank you, Julia and the Henry and Marilyn Todd Foundation uh, for your support of this report and this event. Um, and thank you to my colleagues at PHI. Um, we did cover quite a bit of content, so I will focus on some of the main highlights over the last 90 minutes uh, as I talk about this summary specifically. Um, we really saw this at PHI as an opening conversation for a longer term concerted effort to improve direct care jobs um, and the state of care in New Jersey. Um, Emily, Julia, and Jody welcomed the group. Um, they really emphasized the importance of PHI's philosophy of, call, of improving care by improving jobs, quality care through quality jobs. Um, they noted the importance of supporting workers who are critical in helping older adults age in place. And Jody mentioned the work that PHI has done nearly, for nearly 30 years uh, of investing in this workforce because it can lead to positive care outcomes and cost savings, but also because it can improve economic stability and the quality of life of workers. Um, Stephen presented our new report, which is available in the chat and also on our website. Um, a few highlights, he noted that this workforce is growing rapidly um, since from 2009 to 2000. 2019, it grew from about 85,000 workers to 110,000 workers, and it will continue to grow in the years ahead. He did notice challenges like poor compensation, economic instability. He noted that all of this has systemic causes and that one of the main systemic causes is low reimbursement rates, um, and that the COVID-19 crisis has worsened all of these challenges, and it's introduced new challenges uh, for direct care workers and their employers. But it's also focused public attention on this workforce and everything that we've been discussing today. Um, he also noted the variety of recommendations that are outlined in our new report, uh, from transforming direct care jobs by through higher wages, compensation, and increased reimbursement rates, to the opportunities to improve jobs through training, career advancement, widespread support. We uh, placed in the report PHI's new job quality framework, uh, which spans five pillars and 29 elements uh, that I'm sure can inform this discussion as well. Um, and the report also notes the long history of discrimination that many direct care workers as women, as people of color and immigrants um, in this sector have faced. The report calls for more research and a stronger data infrastructure and forming a statewide work group um, and a long-term advocacy initiative to improve these, these conditions. Um, Rukaya spoke about the challenges that are facing um, direct care workers and the lack of data that we have on COVID-19 and this workforce. The states are simply not collecting data on cases, on hospitalizations and deaths by profession. And that limits the data on workers, direct care workers, uh, but many other workers. Um, it doesn't really describe the full impact were her was her phrase. Um, she noted that healthcare workers of color are more likely to support people with COVID-19 and test positive for COVID-19 themselves. I mean, often these workers lack paid sick leave and health insurance, and because of a history of structural racism, which she defined as the laws and policies that are written and enforced that disproportionately impact people of color, these workers simply are not valued, recognized, or compensated in the way that they should. Um, she noted the importance, especially in this moment, but beyond, of ensuring that workers have access to masks, to PPE, to hand sanitizer, to paid sick leave, hazard pay, disaggregated data, 
um, and in many, including these measures and stay at home measures um, and guaranteed basic income as well and workers' compensation. Um, Ev Liebman really asked us to think about this moment as a moment of policy necessities, that we are in a second wave of COVID-19, that in New Jersey, there have been currently about COVID outbreaks in about 200 facilities, but about 850 since the crisis began. Um, the AARP has really focused on rebalancing the long-term care system since most people want to age in place in their homes and communities, but they need a quality direct care workforce and family caregivers, and that New Jersey has made good progress but it's not there. They are 46 in the country, according to Ab, in terms of dollars directed at HCBS dollars, and that we need to better balance that system to free up dollars and resources for direct care workers. She noted specifically a few recent reforms from mandatory minimum staffing ratios for direct care workers in facilities, increasing the minimum wage, increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates, um, also the first in the national direct care funding ratio for long-term care facilities, which will limit the dollars that can be used for administration or for profits. Um, and that she argued that what we need is a fundamental change in long-term care to reimagine a completely different model. Um, Diane spoke about the impact on consumers of home care, that payers are reducing the amount of services they are authorizing and that clients are at risk of poor outcomes, but workers are resilient and they are essential to the system, to their clients, to controlling costs. And she was moved by recommendation three in the report around job improvements, about quality training. She noted a, a program where she's um, empowering a cohort of expert aides as peer mentors, peer, peer mentors uh, certified community health workers. Um, and she spoke specifically about compassion fatigue, um, what it means, means to have the repetitive loss of clients. Um, Steve spoke about the importance of improving wages, training, tuition reimbursement, and how much work needs to be done that workers provide high impact, they save lives, hundreds of thousands of dollars saved was his phrase. And the two big picture issues he saw was the plight of the direct care workers, but also the cost and affordability of long-term care, given growing demand, more older people, and a decreasing caregiver ratio. Um, he said that he'd like to see um, New Jersey rebalance and spend more money um, and create an investment in direct care workers, um, but also capitalize on the moment of a nursing shortage where potentially one career ladder might be to also support home health aides and becoming nurses. Um, many people pose questions in the chat. We encourage, um, we'll follow up with as many as we can and we encourage people to email me and others at PHY as well. People noted how can other states replicate what New Jersey is doing for home care workers what are the top three things that New Jersey can do to attract more CNAs and many more? Um, when we polled uh, in the first round, we saw that for the most part, people were really energized around improving compensation, improving reimbursement rates, um, career advancement and gender and racial inequalities, addressing bo both efforts um, and launching a multi-year advocacy effort. And when we pulled again for what we should do next and what was resonating based on people's comments, what rose to the top was really about forming a statewide work group and launching a multi-year advocacy effort when I think there's incredible opportunity in New Jersey and we've seen it around the country, the potential of statewide work groups and multi-year advocacy efforts that can bring all of us together, similar to this call, um, to talk about what are the ideas, what are the shared challenges and how do we work together. Um, just as next steps before I wrap up, we will we are recording this and so we will make the video available online. Um, PHI and the Henry and Marilyn Top Foundation will regroup um, to debrief this conversation and to really figure out how to keep this momentum going. Um, the report is available online, so please share with your colleagues and with your networks. Um, and please don't con hesitate to contact any of us at PHI. Um, again, thank you for your participation, for your attention, and I will pass it back to Emily. Thank you, Robert. So I don't know about all of you, but uh, as I listened to Robert, I was trying to tap into just how I was feeling in this moment. Um, and I think what was coming up for me is I just have a, an immense amount of gratitude and appreciation for sharing this space with all of you and sharing this work with all of you. Um, so I would encourage if you wanna drop a word or two into the chat box of just how you're feeling walking away um, from our time together today, I'd be interested to see where everyone is at. Um, I'm going to keep taking advantage of thanking Julia and the Henry and Marilyn Taub Foundation. <laughs> I see you, Julia, um, because again, we wouldn't be here without them. So thank you. This has been so fulfilling and inspiring. And um, I'm just very grateful to, again, each of our panelists, um, to our team here at PHI, and to every single person who logged in today 
uh, to one more Zoom meeting. Thank you so much. So I'm seeing optimistic, energized, inspired, um, and again, just very grateful. So with that, I leave you and I wish you a wonderful rest of your afternoon.